like to start with a provisional definition of consciousness. Provisional because being prior to objective experience, consciousness cannot be defined in the terms of objective experience. Consciousness is that in which all experience appears, with which all experience is known, and out of which all experience is made. So let's explore this. All that is or could ever be known is experience. And all experience is mind. Thinking, imagining, feeling, sensing, perceiving. Therefore, the mind's knowledge of whatever it knows or perceives is only ever as good as its knowledge of itself. Whether the world that the mind experiences exists outside of itself, as some people believe, or whether the world that the mind experiences exists within itself, as everyone in fact experiences. In both cases, the mind's knowledge of that world can only ever be as good as its knowledge of itself. And therefore, the highest endeavor that a mind can ever embark on is an investigation into its own essential nature. As such, the ultimate science is the science of mind. What is the ultimate nature of mind? The ultimate nature of mind must be that aspect of mind which remains consistently present throughout all its knowledge and experience. It must be that aspect of mind that cannot be removed from it or separated from it under any circumstances, states, or situations. What is the essential, irremovable, irreducible nature of your mind? What aspect of your mind is present when you are 
deeply depressed, experiencing an ecstatic moment of joy, or simply having lunch with friends. Knowing or being aware or consciousness itself. Whatever it is that knows the experience of depression is the same knowing with which an ecstatic moment of joy or lunch are known. All we know of the world is experience. All experience is mind. And the essential nature of mind is consciousness. So the only question that remains is, what is the nature of consciousness? What is the nature of the knowing with which the finite mind knows its knowledge and experience? And who or what could know the nature of consciousness or awareness? Consciousness or awareness is the knowing element in all experience. It is all that is present to know anything. Therefore, if, if consciousness, if the nature of consciousness is to be known, it can only be known by itself. How much distance is there between consciousness and consciousness? What does consciousness have to do or where does it have to go to know the nature of its, of its own being? What does the sun have to do to illuminate itself? Consciousness knows itself simply by being itself. Its being itself is its knowing of itself. Consciousness is too close to itself to know itself in subject-object relationship. It cannot turn round and look at itself just as the sun cannot turn round and shine on itself. Thus, there is no room for a path from consciousness to consciousness. No room for a method. Consciousness is knowing of its own being, is in fact the only completely effortless experience there is. It is pure peace itself. It is for this reason that Ashtavakra said, for the sage, even blinking is too much trouble. He didn't mean the sage, a person. He meant the sage, the only one that truly is and knows, awareness itself. Awareness doesn't need to rise in the form of the finite mind in order to know its own being. It knows itself by itself, in itself, as itself, through itself. <coughs> 
That is why the Sufis say, I knew my Lord through my Lord. to ask consciousness, I'm caricaturing consciousness now. If thought were to ask consciousness or awareness, do you ever experience yourself appearing or disappearing? Consciousness would, so to speak, check out its own experience of itself and respond if it could respond. No, in my own experience of myself, I am ever-present. If thought were to ask consciousness, do you ever find any limit to yourself? Consciousness would return its knowing to itself, check out its own experience of itself, and respond, if it could respond. No, I find no limits within myself. I am unlimited or infinite. In other words, in consciousness's experience of itself, and consciousness is the only one present that can know anything about consciousness, it is eternal and infinite. Eternal doesn't mean everlasting in time, and infinite doesn't mean, mean extended indefinitely in space. It means literally without dimension. I'm not speaking in abstract philosophical terms about a consciousness that none of us have access to or know anything about. I'm speaking about the very knowing with which each of us is now knowing our experience. That knowing has no dimensions. It is not in time or space. So thought might reasonably ask, if this dimensionless consciousness is that in which all experience appears, with which all experience is known and out of which all experience is made, how is it possible for this four-dimensional experience of time and space, events and objects, to appear in and be made of something that itself has no dimensions. I would suggest that the finite mind is the activity of consciousness. That infinite consciousness has the ability to vibrate within itself. And that vibration is the activity of the finite mind. In other words, it is infinite consciousness itself that vibrating within itself freely assumes the form of the finite mind in order to know objective experience. <coughs> 
in order to know objective experience, that is, in order to know a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves. Consciousness must seem to become a separate subject of experience. In other words, for consciousness to bring forth manifestation within itself, it must seem to overlook the knowing of its own infinite being to freely assume the form of the finite mind, the apparently separate subject of experience, from whose point of view it is able to know objective experience. The finite mind is, as such, not an entity with its own independent existence. It is an activity. It is the agency through which and as which consciousness is able to know itself as the world. Let me give you an analogy to make this a little clearer. And I have to introduce Mary and Jane to you. Imagine Mary attending the SAND conference in San Jose. After the last meeting, she goes to her room and falls asleep. So Mary in San Jose falls asleep and she dreams that she is Jane in New York. In this analogy, Mary represents infinite consciousness, Jane the finite mind. Now, just as Mary's mind is capable of assuming the form of an infinite number of thoughts. So, when she falls asleep, her mind is capable of assuming the form of an infinite number of dreams. On this particular night, she dreams that she is Jane in New York, but she might just as well have dreamt that she was Claire in London, or Claudia in Berlin, or Keiko in Tokyo. In order to experience the streets of London, Mary has to fall asleep to her own mind. She has to overlook the knowing of her own mind as it is in San Jose. And as a result of this overlooking or forgetting, of the nature of her own mind. She is able to assume the form of Jane's mind, from whose point of view Mary is able to know the streets of London. From Jane's point of view, it seems quite clear to her that her experience is divided into two distinct realities. Mind on the inside, and matter on the outside. When Jane closes her eyes, the world, London vanishes. When she opens her eyes again, London reappears. And she reasonably concludes from this that the knowing with which she knows the streets of London is located just behind her eyes, in her head. Moreover, everything that she experiences outside of herself, outside of herself seems to be made out of something other than herself. That is, something other than her own finite mind. <clears throat> 
and the name she gives to this something other than my mind is matter. In fact, matter was a term that the Greeks invented two and a half thousand years ago to account for that part of our experience that takes place outside mind. Infinite consciousness falls asleep to the knowing of its own infinite being. It forgets itself. And this forgetting of itself enables it to assume the form of the finite mind from whose perspective it is able to know an outside object, other or world. As such, the finite mind is the activity through which consciousness manifests creation. The finite mind is the agency of manifestation. But it comes at a price. Consciousness loses itself in its own creativity. Like a spider that spins her web out of herself and then becomes entangled in her web. So consciousness spins the world within itself and in doing so seems to become a separate self in the world from whose perspective that world now seems to be known. Now this view Jane has of her experience would be fine if it were not for one experience. The experience of suffering. The experience of suffering is a crack in James' otherwise seamless paradigm of mind and matter. Jane spends much of her life trying to ease the pain of her suffering through the acquisition of objects, substances, states of mind, activities and relationships, but none of them fully satisfy her. And one day in a cafe, Jane meets a friend who explains to her that if she wants lasting peace and happiness, she has to investigate the nature of her own mind. Jane asks herself the question that we started with this evening. What is the nature of my own mind? And this is one of those magical questions it is a unique question because it is a question which invites the mind not to go outwards towards objective experience but to begin to trace itself backwards or inwards or selfwards towards its own essential irreducible reality. And as Jane begins to ponder the nature of her mind, her mind sinks more and more deeply into its source. And as it sinks into its source, it is gradually divested of its limitations. And at a certain moment, Jane falls asleep. And as she falls asleep, Mary wakes up. Jane realizes that the knowing with which she knew her experience belongs to Mary. In other words, it was not Jane who was knowing the streets of London. Jane is not an entity, she is an activity. The only entity present in Jane's mind and in Jane's world is Mary's 
infinite, indivisible mind. It is infinite consciousness that freely assumes the form of the finite mind in order to bring forth manifestation within itself. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns to shape them and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Shakespeare. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, a poet's pen turns to shape them and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. As infinite consciousness bodies forth the finite mind within itself, thought abstracts a multiplicity and diversity of apparently separate objects and selves, giving infinite consciousness, God's infinite being, a temporary name and form. But no self or thing ever comes into existence. Existence from the Latin ex and sistere means to stand out from. In reality, nothing stands out from God's infinite being. There is only God's infinite being, infinite self-aware being, modulating itself within itself, appearing to itself through the agency of the finite mind as the multiplicity and diversity of objective experience. But at no point does any self or object ever come into existence. That's why the Sufis say, everything is God's face. We cannot even say that consciousness is everything. There are no things for consciousness to be the all of. There is just consciousness, just God's infinite being. And if there is just consciousness, how can we even call it consciousness? Without something to contrast consciousness with, such as an object. The word consciousness by itself signifies nothing. For this reason, it is not possible to say a single true word. <clears throat> 
as the painter Shatin Sarachi once said to my mother, if God exists, how do you dare even mention his name? <laughs>